Notre Dame Basilica in Ho Chi Minh City, or as it was known then, Saigon. The National Museum of Vietnamese History in Hanoi. The Dalak Palace Hotel in Dalak. What do all of these buildings have in common? They are all Vietnamese tourist destinations. They are all historical buildings, and they were all built and designed by the French. French colonial influence in the urban landscape of Vietnam was endemic during French occupation from 1887 to 1954. Construction works ranged from railways and bridges to factories and mines to private villas and public administration offices. By exploring Saigon, Hanoi and the Lac's urban history, we will see how discourses of French imperial identity, race relations and the dangers of colonial spaces shaped France's construction and transformation of the Indo-Chinese landscape. It is important to note that although these themes are explored in relation to a city, they shaped all colonial building projects in Indochina and the French colonies. What will become evident is how despite the power and authority French architecture imposed on colonial spaces, it reflected weaknesses in France's imperial identity. French colonialism in modern day Vietnam began in 1858 and by 1887, the Federation of Indochina comprised of three regions, Tonkin, Annam, and Cochin, China. Cambodia and Laos would later be added. However, throughout its colonial administration, the capital of Indochina moved three times. From 1887 to 1902, it was in Saigon. It moved to Hanoi until 1939, then to Dalak, and back to Hanoi after World War II. During its time as a capital in the late 19th century, the city of Saigon underwent extensive transformation. From wooden buildings to paved boulevards, Saigon was an impressive city. As a capital, the city embodied France's imperial identity, authority, power and prestige, and demonstrated its undeniable French ownership and control. Military theory was translated onto blueprints to assert French presence and establish a domineering and inviolable image of the nation. Buildings were purposely grandiose, big in size, with sharp right angles. Reference was made to Roman, Baroque and Art Deco styles, an imposition of Western ideals of beauty and order onto the landscape. Many works were undeniably housemen. This was imperative to imperial rule. French expertise was commissioned to impress upon primitive societies the ingenuity, wizardry and creativity of European intellectualism and progress. But most importantly, if the French could not subjugate and dominate the colonies, they would lose it. There were also practical reasons. Condition to the tree-lined streets, wide open spaces and stable concrete monuments, French colonials like, like George Derwell regarded the areas where locals lived with disdain. There, in both sight and smell, the traveller feels the perfectly unpleasant sensation of approaching a slum, for in front of him, right next to the dusty and often muddy road which leads to the old bridge, he encounters a shapeless mass of decrepit and lamentably rickety huts, which emerge from pools of stagnant water, forming an ugly and unsightly view unworthy of the great city. These colonies were conceptualised as an unsanitary and underdeveloped space. If France wanted the colony to thrive, it needed to be inhabitable for its officers. Furthermore, standardised construction and organisation of bureaucracy ushered Saigon into a new age. It was not just another colonial city. It was the Paris of the extreme Orient. Between 1861 to 1865, development began. Ancient moats were flooded, riverbanks raised, docks extended, streets renamed. The administrative quarter formed a square in Saigon, the governor's palace, meeting hall, treasury and central post office. These buildings purposely imitated Paris. The Notre Dame Basilica was completed in 1880 after three years of construction. However, in the years after its inauguration, it was observed that this beautiful monument of brick and stone had begun to tilt. One of the towers began to sink. Like Notre Dame in Paris, the Cathedral of Saigon now has towers of unequal height. Spires were added in 1895 to address this. Two bell towers and topped with crosses. The church's height was 16 and a half metres. The Roman inspired cathedral could be seen from the river many miles away. Despite this, not everyone believed the towers were even. 
This was the defeat of French engineering and architecture, but also more metaphorically an undermining of religious institutions and powers the colonial administration wielded to dominate the colonized land. Imperial motives behind public building projects in Indochina shifted in 1909 ditching a forceful architectural form of control and associationist framework in emphasize winning the hearts and minds of indigenous populations. Native customs and institutions respected. Incorporation of local culture into architecture was intended as a sign of respect and tolerance, but also to quell indigenous resistance and political dissent. Architecture was still a tool employed by the colonial administration to dominate the land and people, but this time with heart and sensitivity. Hanoi's urban history under French occupation began in 1883. Wide boulevards were lined with trees, elegant villas erected, Eurocentric ideals to the spatial order. In 1923, reputed French architect Ernest Hebrard was appointed Indochina's Director of Architecture and Urban Planning, renowned for rendering colonialism more appealing to indigenous populations. He studied native and photographed local architecture. Incorporating this previously ignored visual style into public works invented a unique Indo-Chinese style. It is present in several buildings where the rigid structure and grandeur of European colonial architecture is decorated with lotus engravings and oriental details. But more obviously, in the Louis Finette Museum, completed in 1931. Now the National Museum of Vietnamese History, it was the archaeological research institution of the French School of the Far East of 1910, before it was refurbished and extensively redesigned. Its new design was an attempt to reconcile the visual elements of East and West in architecture, traditional French styles fused with a popular pagoda. Although this unique Indochina style did not take off anywhere else, the associationist policy allowed for the Vietnamese middle class and elite to be educated in French schools and Western thought, and it allowed them to move up the administrative ranks. This threatened the metropolitan elite, especially in terms of contact with Indigenous peoples. Racial segregation had been imposed in both Saigon and Hanoi. Saigon, occupied by the Vietnamese and French, was purposely five kilometres away from De Leung, the economic and commercial hub dominated by Chinese merchants. Designated areas for Vietnamese populations in Hanoi, the 36 streets in the outskirts of town effectively excluded and othered locals. Close proximity to the Vietnamese also threatened the European body. The bodies of Vietnamese people were conceptualised as carriers of contamination. Furthermore, Indo-Chinese climate was often linked to disease. In addition, daily French newspapers published in Hanoi and Saigon reflected the health anxieties of expatriate populations. Causes of European deaths speculated in columns, stray animals reported, corpses on the street landed itself on the front page, frequent complaints about the dirty and smelly Vietnamese. To give the colony the best possible chance of survival, an exclusive settlement far from indigenous peoples was designed. Because weather on the hill was dry, windy, and cooler than most areas, building two hill stations and moving the new capital there, to the lap, would create a healthy paradise for colonialists and their children. Designed as a summer seat of government, a French journalist in 1937 observed that the city was undeniably French in design. French determination has created an elegant and harmonious town, developed in such a way that it has become a veritable little paradise in a setting of flowered gardens and pine trees. Everywhere, delectable villas hide behind lovely gardens, gardens full of flowers from Europe. Roads are wide, asphalted, and offer breathing room. On the vast artificial lake's limpid waters, majestic swans swim by. It also enforced racial segregation. In 1922, a large section of the city was designated for European housing only to isolate French expatriates from the Vietnamese who were deliberately housed beyond the northern hills. But this did not work. And this is reflected in the iconic Bella Palace Hotel. Completed in 1922, it embodied colonial leisure, travel and power. As the nerve centre of proper Western colonial society in the highlands, its monumentalism, luxury and location made it a symbol of French domination in the hills. Its power was further reinforced by the long queues for clean water, as for a time it was the only place in the lap to provide purified water. 
featuring 38 rooms, an orchestra, cinema, tennis courts, private fruit and vegetable gardens, a dancing hall, writing facilities, gymnastics equipment, and a French restaurant. It was inspired by seaside restaurants alongside the French Riviera. Its audience was undeniably French, or at the very least European. However, several problems plagued the building. French's stretched treasury, delayed inauguration following the death of death of Vietnamese workers, prone to leaks, the hotel's prices emulated that in Europe and therefore no one could afford it. However, the ultimate failure of the hotel and Alap was at the exclusion of Vietnamese spaces and people's inner city centre and design did not work. The growing affluence of Vietnamese people since the 1920s, those who had thrived under the colonial system, meant that soon European guests were intermingling with Vietnamese ones as well. These colonial structures, despite acting as symbols of French influence and power, ultimately exposed weakness in France's imperial identity. The threat of revolt was too great in Saigon that the Vietnamese and Chinese communities needed to be five kilometres apart. Associationist policies, whilst more sensitive to the indigenous people and cultures, were implemented to subdue the population. The efforts in combating threats to the immune system founded a new city. Some of the buildings stand and serve government administrative functions under communism now. In fact, the integration of French architecture into the Vietnamese national identity may have been too perfect, as Ed Haysom muses. I asked a Vietnamese friend of mine about what he considered to be a traditional Vietnamese style, and he pointed to this stuff and said, that's, that's traditional Vietnamese references back to Europe, which I think is... Very odd.